The Christmas Tree. This is a story of a foster home run by a cruel and conniving woman who squanders all the money meant for the children on herself. All the kids have to look to for companionship is a beautiful pine tree that sits outside their window. That is until a new helper comes to the orphanage, and with her help and a little bit of magic, they all discover how wonderful Christmas can truly be. That seems like a pretty good synopsis you'd find on the back of a video case, right? Well, just like The Room or Birdemic, you have got to see this thing to believe it. I, I know people are tossing these comparisons around these days like it was nothing, but believe me, this is the Troll 2 of animated Christmas specials. They constantly recycle animation, and there are just so many unintentional, hilarious moments. Our story takes place in an orphanage with some children and a pine tree. Mel? I have a job for you. What do you want? Well, licorice. Now who's licorice? <coughs> a dog. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, tell her not to cut Mrs. Hopewell. Don't worry about that, little one. Your tree, uh, I mean Mrs. Hopewell, is going to be all right. Look at this scene where this woman finds out that her daughter may have fallen off a cliff and died. Oh god, what do you mean? Ray. And the titular Christmas tree is barely in it. We see them play on it like once. There's forced dialogue at the end to explain the children's connection to the tree, and some creepy narration at the beginning. The pine tree they named Mrs. Hopewell. Yes, Hopewell. Because the kids believed that the tree was magical. It somehow was going to bring them a mom and a dad. Someday, Mrs. Hopewell is going to bring us a mom and a dad. She takes care of us. So basically, these kids have gone completely children of the corn. <laughs> Don't believe me? What happened? I don't know. She got struck by lightning. It was either the tree or Santa that struck her down. And the way Santa sounds in this, I believe it. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas, everybody! I know I usually choose these specials for the things that are good about them, but what can I say? If you're the kind of person who's into this stuff, then try and track it down. It's probably the only time you can laugh at orphans on Christmas and nobody goes to hell. And Mrs. Mavilda, well, she's going to be all right. From what I've heard, she went back to work in the orphanage as Judy's assistant. <laughs> well, don't worry about Mrs. Mavilda. She's good now. She learned that you always win when you are good. Merry Christmas, everybody. What the hell was that? Raggedy Ann and Andy in the Great Santa Claus Caper. This wily e. Coyote ripoff is heading to Santa's workshop to force his stupid invention, which is basically just Lucite, on toy production. Behold, the perfect gift, unbreakable forever. And then he has the balls to charge kids money for toys they can't even play with. Luckily, Comet, the reindeer, catches wind of this and heads out to find the best candidates to help. It's got to be uh, somebody who is very, very light and, and can't freeze. Why, of course! How stupid of me! Raggedy Ann and Andy! I like that she was smart enough to figure out who she could get under these conditions, but didn't have the wherewithal to just warn Santa that some crazy wolf was heading his way. I mean, he could have just set out an extra Yeti or two. As you may have noticed by now, this special was produced by the one and only Chuck Jones. And to his credit, it's wonderfully animated. And I like the little back and forth that these characters have. Tell me, me darling Raggedy Ann, tell me what happens to Christmas toys. After Christmas, that is. Guess toys wear out, right here. Well, your little sister breaks them. Little brothers break toys, too. And it's kind of dark when the wolf realizes that take the bunch of toys he's talking to and seal them up forever. But if you're expecting something as memorable as the Grinch or even the other Raggedy Ann special Jones produced, uh, this may fall a little short. Even the ending seems a bit forced. Yes, baby. Glipstick can't stand up against it. It did it? What if did it? It. Love. 
and then Annie just takes a sledgehammer to the fourth wall in a way that's actually cringeworthy. Everybody out there watching, do you want all your presents sealed in gloop stick? Of course you don't. So, all together now. One, two, three. No! But you know what? You should never look a gift blue camel in the mouth, no matter how bizarre. This is still a nice little holiday presentation by a master of animation. So, like Anne, enjoy it for what it is. Raggedy edges and all. Anyway, Merry Christmas, everyone! The Gift of Winter this animated special comes from Canada and gets notoriety for featuring the voice talent of SNL alumni Gilda Radner and Dan Aykroyd. But man, if you thought the Christmas tree was on a shoestring budget, then what you're looking at here is dental floss. Check out the sound effects. Slam! Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that was an artistic choice. I found this on a DVD in the dollar store and wow, does it look nothing like this? Actually, this special has a history of deceptive covers going all the way back to the VHS era. In this world, people are monochromatic globs with names that match their dominant traits. Now, you're nicely. Uh, no, I'm goodly. Ah, uh, yes, then you're nicely. Me? I'm rotten. I'm small. I'm confused. Hello, confused. I'm bizarre. I'm confused. I'm fed up. Well, who's malicious? She's malicious. Are you sure? No, I'm tender. I Naturally, being a colorful sort, the townspeople head up to the Bureau of Winter to file a formal complaint about how unpleasant winter is. Well, these two at least. These two want to blow winter up. Overall, winter seems like a really unpleasant fellow, until he overhears a certain conversation. That old winter must be really mean to make things so awful. Well, uh, maybe he can't help it. Maybe he's unhappy. Maybe he's lonely. That kind of thing hurts, you know, and sometimes causes meanness. Well, for some reason, whenever Winter shows an emotion other than anger, it starts to snow, which of course makes everyone happy. They are literally playing in his tears right now. These characters would show up again in a Halloween special called Witch's Night Out, where everything is approved across the board, but uh, this is okay in its own right. It's bizarre, rough, and dragging at times, but still a nice little story about how one moment of empathy changed the world forever. Huh? Huh? Yogi's First Christmas. This is one of my favorite childhood cartoons. I still have the VHS that I will watch over and over again around every Christmas. The usual stable of Hanna-Barbera characters are heading to the beloved Jellystone Lodge for the annual Christmas carnival. But due to years of low turnout and a rash of vandalism, it looks like it might be the last year the lodge has before its owner, Mrs. Throckmorton, sells it. But before you can say serendipity, this is the year that all the festivities wake up Yogi and Boo Boo early from their hibernation. To say the least, there are shenanigans, as Yogi tries to stay awake to see his first Christmas. The only reason Ranger Smith and Manager Dingwell don't send Yogi back to his cave is because he manages to rescue Mrs. Throckmorton several times during the special. Then there's Throckmorton's mean-spirited nephew, Snively, who eventually teams up with the mean-spirited Herman the Hermit, and they try to ruin Christmas any way they can. Although due to Yogi's oblivious interference, they end up alone and looking in from the snow, which leads to one of the sweetest moments of my childhood. Oh, ho, ho. bring those latecomers over here. Old Santa may have something for them. For, for us? Maybe. Who knows? Here's one says, Happy Holiday to Snively. And this one says, Merry Christmas to Herman. In spite of all we done, he bought Christmas gifts for us. Comes Christmas time, bygones is bygones. It's what you call Christmas spirit. You know something, Herman? They're not dum-dums. We are! What a twist! 
So in the end, the two troublemakers learn to enjoy themselves. Throckmorton decides not to sell the lodge, and Yogi gets to see his first Christmas before he falls back to sleep. Ho, ho, ho. Oh yeah, there's uh, one other thing this special is kind of infamous for. You see, Cindy Bear's there too, and when she discovers that you can kiss anyone that's standing under mistletoe, um, she does this. It was pretty much the most bizarre thing I had seen in my then short existence. So, naturally, I watched it again, and again, and again. Wonder if it had any effect on me. That movie has warped my fragile little mind. Blue Toes. It's getting close to Christmas, and all the elves at Santa's village are at top form. All except one. I told you to stick to the lower branches, but I did. See? Oh, small one, you've been picking from saplings. As you can see, the elf known as Little One really wants to help, but usually ends up making a mess out of things. Which is partly because he's too young to know any better, but also partly because the other elves ignore him. I take it those were our stockings? Um... And I suppose that was the polar bear he tried to warn you about earlier. You can blame Little One for the socks, but you can't blame him for the yellow snow trails leading up to your smug asses. Anyway, there's another one of those confused day tripper penguins, and Little One promises him that Santa will take him home. But Santa is way too busy, so rather than just wait till after Christmas, Little One decides to shove the penguin into Santa's sack. Good night, everybody. They have plenty of room because in all the chaos, two toys were left behind. Santa heads back to the North Pole to get them, but Little One thinks that they've been forgotten. So Little One does the best with what he has. A few of those little toys he picked earlier, and his own stockings. How much would it have sucked if it turned out they were on the naughty list? So from this day forward, all the boys and girls will wake up on Christmas morning to find a stocking filled with small and wondrous things. Picked and packed and hung with care by Blue Toes. Oh boy! Yeah, you can kind of see why this one didn't catch on. Nothing says Christmas like hypothermia and deep tissue damage due to congelation. But I think we can all relate to Blue Toes. We've all been told at one point that we were too young to do something that we really wanted to be a part of. But it just goes to show you that the most young and eager of us are those that will go the extra heartfelt mile when finally given the chance. Merry Christmas! And a Merry Christmas to everyone! The Trolls and the Christmas Express Here's an odd little special I found sitting in a dollar store in the middle of summer. It's about a pack of trolls that are set on ruining Christmas. But, uh, why do we want to wreck Christmas, Troglo? What's the matter with those? We're trolls, Clud! Uh, oh yeah, uh, I forgot. We're trolls. Well, I guess it's just because they are bad trolls. So they sneak into the village and try their best to sabotage all the toys, but the damage they do is minimal and easy to ignore, just like real trolls. Although I have to say, some of those troll toys look pretty cool. I wonder if they have those at Hot Topic. So the trolls assume if they can't wreck the toys, they can ruin Santa's transportation. Don't let them get to sleep! Keep them awake all night! That'll keep them from flying! Everybody sing, Stomp the Troll Song. Don't eat a voice, it's smooth and sweet. Don't even eat to keep the beat. Clap your hands and stamp your feet. We're the simple souls. souls, we're trolls. By the way, if that troll sounds a lot like the Grinch, well that's because that's Hans Conry, widely known for the voice of Captain Hook, but also played the Grinch on several occasions. Like the Christmas tree, the thing the special is named after is barely in it. We see it once, and then again at the end. 
We take the tracks from here, lay it straight down from the North Pole till it meets railroad tracks leading all over the world. Yeah, we could use the train to deliver all the gifts, but uh, you see, there's just one minor setback. It's a train. Ah, well, if it could work for the Polar Express. Well, when the train starts heading back to the workshop, the elves finally catch on and ask the trolls why they're trying to ruin Christmas. People have never liked us. Never? Mm. Then how do you explain this? One of our favorite Christmas songs. <laughs> To roll with the ancient Yuletide carol. What? Why does it say that? Troll. Give me that book. Actually, to roll means to sing or play happily. And it turns out that they were more than happy to be included. Just like real trolls. But just look at this face that they decide to end on. Yeah, I totally believe that that guy's good now. This is a keeper for me. It's got a nice vintage style of animation that I'm not really familiar with. A voice acting icon, and I got it for a steal. Not like those poor bastards back in 1987. 20 bucks for young Sherlock Holmes? Father Christmas. Does the style look familiar? Well, it should. This is kind of an indirect side pre Promethequil of another beloved holiday classic. The Snowman, based off the book by Raymond Biggs and directed by Diane Jackson. The British creative team were going to return to bring us Father Christmas, but sadly, Jackson only storyboarded the project before she eventually got too sick uh, due to a fight with cancer. But man, how talented was she to craft not one, but two incredibly charming specials. But while the snowman had no dialogue and possessed a, what I can only describe as a ethereal quality, Father Christmas hits a little closer to home. To lay it simple, Santa goes on a vacation. During the off-season, of course. It's fun seeing Santa act normal. He goes to different places, meets different people, eats too much, and acts like a total tourist, which is what he is. Ooh. No chips, mate. Uh, chips? <laughs> Le fruit? Oh, sacré bleu. Vous plaisantez, non, monsieur? I think that means no blooming chips. Mm. How about ketchup, then? No real conflict in this special, aside from the usual hassles of vacationing. Bad weather and a hefty room service bill. And, um, speaking of Americans, if my fellow citizens are wondering why they haven't seen this, well, it's because Santa indulges in the vine more than once. And if you can't have Santa be near a store that's out in the open for the other 11 months of the year, how freaked out would parents get seeing Santa get ripped? I mean, they usually based R-rated comedies around that premise. While it doesn't have the captivating quality the snowman has, it's still a charming slice of life of a beloved holiday icon. Goodbye! <laughs> A Christmas Carol. I said it during my first special, but there are literally over 200 versions of the Charles Dickens classic. But where the stingiest man in town holds a special place in my heart for being the most emotionally impacting, uh, to me at least, this version earns a spot for being the most visually impressive. Produced by Chuck Jones and directed by Richard Williams, of Who Framed Roger Rabbit fame, the imagery presented is a jaw-dropping combination of detail and fluid movement that only true masters of animation could possibly create. It aired on TV, but was so well-received that it got a theatrical run, which made it eligible for the Oscars. In fact, it won Best Animated Short that year, making it the only adaptation of the classic tale to earn an award from the Academy. But apparently, members were so upset that afterwards, they added a rule that said TV presentations that got theatrical runs were ineligible from receiving awards. Scrooge is gonna Scrooge, I guess. But despite holding that honor, it's not the strongest version in terms of flow. Sometimes scenes just stop, and too often it relies on the audience already being familiar with the story. That might work with spins or parodies, but this is supposed to be a straight retelling. 
Although I love how they elaborate on the part where the Ghost of Christmas Present shows Scrooge all the poor workers that have to spend the holidays in the harshest and most isolated conditions, yet still keep the spirit of Christmas in their hearts. Although it lacks in storytelling, it's still a visual masterpiece that can't help but stir the emotions. <laughs> The Bernstein Bears Christmas Tree. Based off the popular book series, the special has seen a bit of a resurgence since its release on DVD. But I'm afraid I missed this one growing up. It's a shame, too. The special starts off with everyone in bear country getting ready for Christmas, including the titular Bernsteins. The only thing they need now is a Christmas tree. But Papa decides that buying a tree just won't do for his family. So, as you can guess, most of the special follows Papa and the two cubs as they search for a tree. But Papa, I don't mean to fuss, but Mom said to buy one from Grizzly Gus. Christmas trees. <laughs> Fresh cut indeed. <laughs> it looks more like some overgrown evergreen weed. <laughs> uh, Merry Christmas, Gus. Well, we were just uh, <clears throat> dumb cubs. However, every tree they find seems to have occupants that don't want to give up their home without a fight. He finally finds a tree that doesn't seem to be protected. But of course, that doesn't mean no one's using it. Pa shouldered his axe and spared the tree. He remembered what Christmas is really about. He'd had it all backwards and inside out. This is a time to be thinking of others. So the kids head back hoping to just buy a tree from Gus, only to find that there's none left. But then they discover that all the woodland creatures who saw Papa spare the little family of birds decorated their house like a big Christmas tree. And so, when thinking of others, Papa ended up showing everyone in bear country just how Christmassy they are. I really don't know why this special fell off the map for so many years. The animation's fine, and it does have a few nice sections of physical comedy and wordplay. I guess people thought it was just for little kids, which means they probably haven't seen the ending. Pop, I'm not thinking of others, bit. How about the salmon? How about it? Your remark shows wit and perception, but in the case of the salmon, <laughs> it will make an exception. The Night After Christmas. This is actually the non-canon Christmas special to an English series called The Forgotten Toys, featuring a duo of vagrant playthings that move from owner to owner. However, if you were stateside, you probably thought it was just another Christmas special released on tape and occasionally ran on the Disney Channel. But both the special and the series feature the voice acting of Bob Hoskins as the bombastic Teddy. And he acts his fuzzy little ass off in this. Hey! Hey! Come and get me! If you don't come and get me, I'll... I'll hold my breath until I burst! See how you feel then! The two toys are thrown out the night after Christmas and just barely escape being crushed in a garbage truck. So on their own, they come up with the only conclusion that toys could possibly make. They've got new toys. We'll get new kids. <laughs> See how they like that. After a few days, a number of missteps, and a new friendship or two, they come across a new twist on a familiar face. Santa Bum, Santa Bum, his name is Santa Bum. Helps toys in the dump and smells of cheap rum. Oh my father, these are the best toys I've ever seen in my life! After he fixes them up, Santa Bum tells them where they can find some loving children who need toys. A lonely, forgotten orphan, not what I was expecting. Well, I, I just kind of assumed that maybe needy kids without parents would appreciate... 
anything a lot more than some kids that would kype toys off the playground that could have just been left there by accident. That ending is kind of a misstep on what I would call a fantastic special. The animation is expressive, the voice acting is amazing, and the dynamic between Teddy and Annie is beautiful. You could have been killed! I'm very attached to my arm! Well, your arm isn't very attached to you! Here. I don't know how fans that actually grew up with the series view this special, but I'll always remember the forgotten toys fondly. Anytime you need friends, just call out my name. Annabelle's Wish. I have to admit, I don't know how forgotten this one is. It was a special that aired on Fox in 1997 and has bounced around cable channels for a couple years since, but no one seems to talk about it. It takes place on a farm where apparently every year Santa not only delivers gifts to all the good boys and girls, but also grants the animals of the world one day of speech. Mom, who is that? This Christmas just so happens to be the night that Annabelle was born, who instantly takes a liking to the idea of flying. I wanna fly! Well, sweetie, you'll have to talk to Santa about that. Now, the farm is owned by a man who's taking care of his grandson, William, who became mute after the accident that killed his parents. You can kind of see where this is going, but it's actually really well done. You see, William also has a rich and trendy aunt, who pretty much just wants to treat William like a centerpiece, her fashion accessory. Hmm, candles? Candy? Tinsel? Something's missing. And you know what that is? A child. She threatens to take William away on the grounds that the grandfather can't raise the boy in proper conditions or give him the medical attention that he needs. Meanwhile, William finds a surprise for him in the barn, in more ways than one. Bless you. <gasps> oh, the cat's out of the bag. William promises to keep the talking a secret, and Annabelle and him become the closest of friends. Oh, I get it. You're pretending she's a reindeer, huh? Uh. Did that dog just threaten to kill Annabelle? Unfortunately, the ant returns next year with a court order, so it looks like this will be William's last year with Grandpa and Annabelle. Unless... There's nothing in here. Billy! You're talking! It's the best Christmas present I ever heard. But it turns out that in order for William to talk, Annabelle had to cash in all of her lifetime's worth of talking. So after many years of happy friendship with William, just when it looks like it's Annabelle's time to literally go out to pasture, Santa comes back to fulfill one last wish. Merry Christmas, Billy! Are you ready to fly, Annabelle? Oh, yes! Then lead the way! It doesn't have the best animation, has a few plot cul-de-sacs, and might grain on your nerves if you don't like country music, but it's a really sweet tale about two friends and the wish they have for each other's happiness. Merry Christmas, Annabelle. Merry Christmas. Ziggy's Gift, another special based off a comic strip, and another one directed by the great Richard Williams. And where A Christmas Carol had a very complex style, the simpler characters here give Williams a chance to show off his comedic timing. And the story is that, well, Ziggy is just a nice guy. Not very talkative, but still very nice. He spends Christmas going around helping out whoever he can find in need. He even decides to buy all the Christmas turkeys from a meat market and let them all free so they can get struck down in traffic or die in the cold. Well, it's the thought that counts. Ziggy also volunteers to be a Santa for charity, but it turns out that the organization that he chose uh, might not be on the up and up. Dreadfully sorry. Thank you for being so patient, gentlemen. But I'm afraid the position has been filled. 
And here's where the special gets confusing and surreal. For some reason, Ziggy has the ability to make money from nothing when he reaches into a kettle he got from the embezzler. How can he do this? It's never explained. And it's barely used. About twice. Once to hand a wad of cash to a legitimate charity, and again to buy all the turkeys. It's weird because he actually meets some needy people, and even leaves the pot with an orphanage, but doesn't use it to give out any more money. And I guess he's the only one that can use it? Because he's being tracked by a pickpocketer who wants the pot for himself, but uh, can't get to it. But you know who I really like in this? The cop. Yeah, he sounds like your typical slapstick, overzealous officer, but he actually does some detective work and rounds up all the crooked Santas. So when he tries to bring Ziggy in, it's not because he's being unnecessarily dickish. Ziggy is a legitimate person of interest. But you're both coming I with me! Santa. <laughs> Silent night! Holy night! All is calm! All is bright! So the three are welcomed into the poor foster home, and at first it's really awkward. But then Ziggy gets an idea to bring in the pot and the Christmas tree you found. And here's where we sort of see what the magic is. The cop uses his badge as a Christmas star and it starts to glow. Then the crook discovers that he can pull toys out of nowhere from his sack. Good night, everybody. So in a way, the magic was always coming together with good intentions and giving what you have from the heart. This sweet comedy of errors is only heightened by William's keen sense of style and timing. And uh, like all his work, there's a healthy dose of nightmare fuel. Oh, Merry Christmas indeed.